Hello, everyone. I gave you a sneak preview of all our intro videos there. <laughs> this is my first time hosting. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Sonia, um, and I will be your host for this Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event today. Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants aims to um, inspire the next generation by bringing science, exploration, adventure, and conservation into classrooms um, through live events like this with experts all over the world. So today we are joined by Carrie from Duke Lemur's um, Center Division of Fossil Primates. She is a fossil preparator, which means she does a bunch of cool things with fossils that we're going to be so lucky to see today. Um, so without further ado, I am going to pass it on to Carrie. We will come back for um, questions with all our wonderful classrooms joining today and those watching on YouTube um, later in the stream. Um, but for now, I am going to bring up Carrie, who is going to talk to you guys. Hello. Hi, Carrie. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm here in my mask. We have the Duke Blue happening in here. Um, Love it. And I'm live in the fossil prep lab um, where I'm going to show you guys what I do with fossils at my job. Um, and so the first thing we can talk about is rocks. I can um, just pop you onto full screen, Carrie. There you go. Okay, thanks. Um, so when we find fossils, they are buried in rocks like this. That's how fossils form. Um, it's that an animal dies and its bones are buried in like mud or some kind of sand. And over millions of years, they get really solidified in this rock and we can find them. Um, the kind that we're going to be prepping today. Here, I'm going to unplug so I can get further over. These are some of the other ones that I have prepared. And you can see they're dark brown. So these are the bones of a really old primate. Um, it's related to a lemur and it actually lived in North America, in Wyoming. Um, and so the bones will be dark brown and the sediment is this sort of gray color. Um, and we've got lots of different body parts. Here's the skull, very cool. And we need to be very careful holding these. Um, the rock surrounding them has kept them in great shape for millions of years. Uh, they're very sturdy, but when we take them out of the rock, they do get really fragile. Um, and so we want to be really careful and put lots of glue on there and make sure that when we're handling the fossils, um, we're watching out for all of the pieces and gluing everything back on um, and just being really careful because fo fossils can be very fragile and easy to break. And they're one of a kind, so we don't want to mess them up. Um, here's some cool examples of some fossils that are from Madagascar. They, these are actually sub-fossils because they're pretty recent. They're less than 10,000 years old. Um, so you can see this is what the skull should look like. And this is the skull covered in a bunch of deposits from a cave. This one's real hard to get into. Um, knock, 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 just super hard and very sturdy. Um, so when we have really sturdy rocks like this one and like this, we need sturdy tools to get to the fossils in the middle. And so one of the things that I have that I work with a lot is, whoop, cords we have cords everywhere this is called an air scribe it is like a tiny jackhammer um, and so it blows air and it vibrates so I can get through all the really hard rock to the fossils um, and then while I am using this tiny jackhammer I have tons of glue um, so I can make sure that the fossils are sturdy and that no pieces are blowing away um, and today what I'm gonna show you guys is I'm gonna prep a fossil out right now, right in front of you. So this is where I can set you guys down so you can see what I'm doing. And we'll have time for some questions first. And I probably should explain a little bit more about all of the things that I do as a fossil preparator. Um, but here is the block that we're gonna be working on. So this is a chunk of rock that's very similar to the one that was behind me that I showed you. Um, and it's all crumbly because 
this rock was at the top. Um, so when my colleagues went to go look for fossils in Wyoming, this was at the surface of the land and the rain had been starting to erode the rocks here. So there's all kinds of flaky pieces. Um, and that means that the bones got pretty fragile. But that is also how my colleagues were able to spot them because it's very hard to find fossils unless you can see them already. So they could see some brown poking out of the landscape. And actually, just real quick, I want to show you guys that landscape. Ooh, I'm tangled. Do, 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 do. Ready? Chords. Okay. Just real quick, I'm going to walk out here. This is my whole prep lab. And this is the rest of our division of fossil primates. We have so many fossils in here. All of these cabinets full of fossils. But if you look behind me, this is a panoramic picture of where we get the fossils in Wyoming. So it's a big landscape, gray rock everywhere. And let's get in here. So you can see that there's a lot of places to look for fossils. Um, so the rain, when it washes down, it'll wash down here and it erodes some of the rock away so we can find fossils there. But it also makes the fossils a little bit fragile um, because they're used to being under the rock where they've been for millions of years. Okay. So I think um, I'm going to... I'm going to, in a minute here, going to turn on the machine so I can use the air scribe so I can do a live prep demo. But if anybody has any like preliminary questions about fossils or about um, getting fossils out of the rock or anything like that, we can talk about those first. I think you're still on mute. I am. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. I am going to bring up um, some of our classrooms and see if they have any preliminary questions for you. Miss Reitman's class, do we have any questions for Carrie right now? Do you have any? About fossil finding questions? Not yet. I think we're going to How hard is it? How? How? How hard is the fossil? Ooh, the fossil, um, some of the fossils are pretty hard still. They're pretty sturdy because they are basically rocks at this point. Um, a, bone, a bone gets replaced by the minerals in the rock over the millions of years. So it's not a bone anymore. It's actually a rock in the form of a bone, which is what a fossil is. Um, they are fossilized. And so they can be pretty sturdy but they are also pretty brittle. Do you know what brittle means? It just means it's really easy to break. So look, here's a part of this rock and boop, it just breaks so easily. Even though the rock is pretty hard, um, we can still break it into a lot of pieces. Um, and so that is the state of the fossils is that they're very hard, but they do crack. So we need to glue the pieces, um, how they came out of the rock. Um, and I see Miss Duffin has Miss Duffin's third grade class has a question about how long it takes to find a fossil, um, and that really depends. So we go with our friends, the geologists, to find the right types of rocks that we know the age of how old the rocks maybe are, um, and then we can confirm that with lots of testing and lots of analysis of the types of rocks that are there. Um, but then we just go scouting around. We look, we've got our sun hats and our binoculars, um, and we can go out there and try to see if we find fossils. They're not always easy to see just with your eyes on the surface. A lot of times you have to like get a little rock hammer and tap in there and see if you can find any. Um, or you can sort of mm, sweep around in some of the, the dirt that's on the ground there. Um, yeah. I think we also have a question from Ms. Salmore's class. Cool. Um, they asked, how do you know how deep the fossil is in the rock? That is a great question. Um, we 
don't know, actually. Um, there's not like a way to, there's no metal detector for fossils. So we can't, we can't always um, see or like have an idea of how many fossils are down there. Um, usually we find fossils sort of either by accident or by breaking little pieces at the surface, or we wait for the water to do the work for us because water is really good at erosion and washing away sediment. So every season after the rain is done and the, the land has dried up again, maybe new fossils are revealed to us. So that's how it works in a lot of places. Um, people also find fossils by accident doing construction, um, digging big holes. They might run into something depending on where they are. Um, so yeah, we don't, we don't always know what is or how deep a fossil is before we find it. And there could be fossils everywhere. Um, there's still so many fossils that people haven't seen. And so the fossil record of the extinct animals that we know existed because we have fossils of them, it's only a really small percentage of everything that's ever existed because we have to find it to be able to know that. We also have a comment from Mrs. Sullivan's class. They said they're enjoying seeing the tools that you use. And mm -hmm. can you share more about the tools that are used to find fossils? Ooh, yes. Okay. So finding the fossils like in the rock here, um, we also use little pins like this. So I can show you right now. Um, to me, I can see the fossil because I've looked at rocks many, many, many times and I've seen where the fossils are, but it's kind of hard to see. Um, let's get it at the right angle here. Turn it around maybe. Okay, where my finger is, this. This right here is the bone. Um, and you'll see it, I can put you under, I have a way for you to see what's in my microscope in a minute, so you'll be able to see it with me. Um, but the first thing that we would do is use our little pin and come in here and just scratch away. Some of the stuff that's on the top here is glue. Um, it's glue that has dirt stuck in it, so it's sort of camouflaging the bone. Um, and that is because when my colleagues found this fossil, they wanted to make sure that it wouldn't break when they brought it home. So they poured a lot of glue on it and the glue had dirt. And so the first thing that we can do is sort of peel off some of this glue and maybe see the fossil a tiny bit better. Um, and I'll show you, you'll be able to see it a lot better in my microscope view. Okay. And we're gonna check in with the Fremont third grade class and see mm -hmm. if they have a question. Cool. Hi, we actually do have a couple of kids who have questions and I didn't know if you can see them or not. See your questions or, or see, see the kids. See the kids. Oh. Uh, no? I can see you, but I cannot see. I'm just wondering if I share my screen. But we'll go ahead and I'll, let me first just go ahead and ask um, some of their questions. Sounds good. Okay. okay. So, Quinn? Um, like, um, my first one was, is there going to be a Nautilus cell in there? Because for some reason I like them. A Nautilus. My brain goes to it. But also, let me, what? What kind of fossil do you think you're going to find? Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, we do have Nautilus. Nautilus is somewhere in the building. Um, and I can ask uh, my colleague Matt about that in a minute, maybe later. But um, in this, we know because of what we found next to it, um, which was... Doo -doo 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 -doo. This guy was sitting sort of on the top but it was upside down. So when my colleagues found it, they saw sort of this situation, but it was covered in a lot of rock. Um, and so we know because this is the skull and we found lots of its other bones next to it, that this is gonna be a small primate from a really long time ago um, in Wyoming. And yeah, so this one's gonna be a primate, but we also find lots of other animals um, 
besides just primates, we find things in Egypt like hyraxes, um, which are big, hairy little football creatures with teeth. Um, very cool. We have turtle fossils. Ooh, here comes Matt with a Nautilus. And we're distant and we have our masks on. Here it is. So yes, and that one's from Madagascar? Okay, that one's from Madagascar. We have a lot of fossils from Madagascar because that's where the lemurs are from. Okay. That's awesome. We're gonna take a final question for now from Miss Little's class, and then I will uh, allow you to set up for the, uh, the live yes. demo. Okay, great. Class. Do you have a question for us? Do I use chisels? Do I use chisels? Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. So when we find, um, when we go out here in Wyoming and we find a big rock like this, um, the team uses hammers and chisels and rock picks and lots of different tools to get this rock out. Um, so yes, we can use chisels. We use a lot of tools from every kind of thing. So for example, I have here some dentist's tools. So things that the dentist used to clean your teeth because I am also cleaning teeth. They're just very different teeth. Um, I've also got a toothbrush because I, sometimes I wanna brush off the fossil with this toothbrush. Um, we have tiny little paint brushes. We have these glue droppers so I can drop glue onto the fossil. And the glue actually is little plastic beads that have been dissolved in acetone, which is the thing that your mom uses to take off her nail polish. Great. Okay. That's awesome, Carrie. I'm going to turn it back to you. So okay. you can show us the demo. We're very excited. Thank you classes yes. for all those questions. Um, after Carrie is done doing her demo, we'll be able to ask some more questions. Okay. And so the first, oop, wait, Whoa. am I on? <laughs> yes, you are. Oop. Oop. There we go. So the first thing that I'm going to show you guys, um, just so you can see how I'm finding where the fossil is, I'm going to put you up there and I'll still be able to hear you because I'm wearing this headset. So I'm gonna put you guys up here, which is, it's a TV monitor that I have hooked up to my microscope. And you're gonna be able to see what I'm seeing in my microscope. And I'm gonna turn on a really loud machine, which is going to be my air scribe machine. And you'll see the fossil in here when I'm starting to uncover it from the rock. And here we go. I'm gonna turn on this machine. Mm -hmm. Okay, and hi guys, this is me, this is my pin. And I'm gonna get my fossil out, get my chair all set up in here. Okay, and here it comes. And I'll make sure that you guys can see it. Okay. And I can see it too, let's get in here. There's part of it. Let's zoom out a little bit. Okay, so this, you can see the bone right here, hopefully. Um, this is the little part that I picked off while you guys were watching with my little pin. And now we're gonna turn on the tiny jackhammer and I'm gonna start uncovering it. And we always want to go parallel to the fossil so we don't so we don't poke the fossil so we're going carefully over the top
Okay, and I'm going to stop the buzzing for a second so I can tell you guys, see how it's already broken. Um, a lot of times fossils come to us already broken because of all of the wind and the rain and the pressure and the rock. And so this was part of a leg bone, a tibia, um, of the primate that we're working on. But it is in quite a few pieces. So at some point, I, as the fossil preparator, will have to decide if I want to take these pieces out of the rock and squish them back together. Or we can just leave it as it is, like this. Um, and we'll know what it was, but it just won't look perfect. So sometimes we have to make choices like that. Um, but usually we try to leave them as they came, um, unless we really need to get more information by putting the pieces back together. So here, let's continue. Um, and Sonia, if you want me to stop, just say something, because I can hear through my headset. So that's the glue that's coming off. Okay, so we've gotten some of the glue off here, the dried glue that was with the dirt, and now we can see the bone pretty clearly. Um, and I got—I want you guys to notice down here, we'll zoom in, and you can see that. Okay, so right there, there's a little part of the bone that is breaking. And also right here, there's a little hole, and that's breaking too. And so I would like to prevent those pieces from breaking more. So I'm going to put a little bit of glue in there. And so I'll get my little pipette. And we'll drop, boop, boop, just like that. And then the glue will soak down into the rock and the bone. And when the acetone evaporates, it'll be sturdy. And then I can keep working on it. 
Um, and that's always the way to go with fossils. Usually they do break, but it's our job as fossil preparators to glue the pieces right back, right where they were. So we don't move anything and we don't change anything around um, unless we're trying to fill like, so this piece, I'm guessing that this that was here, this piece of bone that was here is actually not in the rock anymore. So that might just be missing. So we probably will want to leave all of these pieces of bones just as they are. We'll zoom out again. And that is going to be part of our limb bone. And I think let's, we can stop and talk about that for a minute and I can show you guys um, some of the other fossils that I've already prepared. Okay. And if you have more questions, hopefully you can see that all right. And then next time when I do the fossil prep, do, 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 my chair went all the way up. Okay, and now it's down. Next time I'll put you guys over here so I can do some, maybe some bigger rock chunks. Okay. Great question. Oh, we're going to start with the YouTube ones. All right. Thank you so much, Carrie. That was awesome to see. Yeah. Um, yeah, we do have some YouTube questions. So the first one is from um, Ms. Adams here. She says, what is your favorite fossil that you found? Hmm. Um, so I myself, I'm the fossil preparator. Um, I have only actually been looking for fossils once. Um, and that is when I went to Tanzania, that is in Africa. Um, and the, the coolest fossil that I found, um, it's fun to find all different kinds of animals as fossils. Sometimes we find frog bones, sometimes we find fish bones, um, and sometimes we find little rodent bones, so like mice and rats. And I think those are really cute to find because they're tiny little jaws. And actually, I have some that I can show you right here. Here I am. Let me get this box. So these are some things that I was working on yesterday from Egypt. Do, 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 do. And I got to get you guys a full rodent jaw here to look at. And I'm picking the wrong ones. Okay. Mm, not that one. Getting closer. Here we go. Okay. So very carefully, I'm going to show you guys tiny little rodent jaw. So you can see this is the rodent incisor that keeps growing. And that's what we know of from rats and mice with their their little teeth at the front. So that's here. And then you can see the little molars. And that's a little jaw from a very old rodent. And in Egypt, I think we're somewhere around 30, 34 million years ago, maybe. And I can double check that on the posters out there. That's amazing. Thank you so much for showing that to us. Mm hmm. Um, we have another question from YouTube. The Bernstein family says, how do you know you'll find a fossil if all you see is rock? Great question. Um, we don't always know if we're going to find a fossil or not, but we, we have our best guesses because we work with the geologists who know the age of the rock there. Um, and so based on the type of environment that it is, like for example, if there was a mountain range slowly rising nearby, and the rain falls and washes a lot of uh, dirt and sediment and rocks down, that's a great environment for animal bones to be buried millions of years ago. So we can, we can um, think about the shape of the land and how old it is um, and how likely it is to have buried bones a long time ago. And then we look there and we just keep scouting around until we find evidence that there are fossils. Um, and that's really the way to do it. We don't always know if there's going to be fossils there or not. Um, a lot of time spent looking for fossils, you don't find anything because um, fossils are pretty hard to find. So 
that's that's part of it too is spending the time and learning the geology learning about the rocks and the land um, so we know where we should look for fossils all right we have one more question from miss diane's class in fort mcmurray and then we are going to go to our classes that are joining us live um so her class asks how can you uncover such small fossils without breaking them? Great, great question. Um, so this bone is actually not the smallest that I've worked with. This bone is, to me, it's pretty big. Um, and that's because a lot of the time I'm working with tiny little rodent jaws and things like this size. Um, and so this is, I'll, I'll, I'll think about it and touch it and see how sturdy it is. And if, it's, if I feel like it's too fragile for me to use my little jackhammer air scribe, um, I won't use it and I will just use my tiny little pins. So I'll just very carefully scrape and brush um, the sediment off of the tiny, tiny fragile bones. Um, and that does take a long time. A lot of this job is patience um, because if you go too quickly, you can really mess up all the fossils and brush them away and you don't wanna do that. Um, so, and then I also have tiny little tweezers to get really small in there. So if there's one tiny piece of one tiny tooth, I can look in the microscope and pick it up and put it back where it came from, like a puzzle, and then glue it on. Um, so it's also a lot like puzzles, but they're 3D puzzles. Um, and so like, you just would look for the place where you'd think um, they go together. So this is a really crisp break. It's a straight line. And this is a really crisp straight line. And so I could try seeing if they fit together and if they don't, then they don't. And that's just how it goes. Um, but we would never glue anything together that we aren't sure um, that that's where it goes. If, if we're not sure, we just leave them apart. That's awesome, Carrie. All right, we are going to start um, visiting our classes that are joining us in the live stream and teachers don't worry about um typing in your questions because everyone's going to have a chance i'm going to bring you all up um, to talk to carrie one at a time so we are going to start with uh, miss reitman's grade three four class hello going first hi 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 where have you found the most bones in, well, all of you guys at once? Hmm. Um, that's a good question, too. Uh, it really depends because there are paleontologists at, uh, at many universities. So we are at Duke University and we have paleontologists here, but there are paleontologists all over the U.S. and all over the world. Um, and actually, I think the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting is this week. So there's a lot of paleontologists talking to each other as we speak, um, and they all find lots of fossils too, but sometimes the number of fossils isn't as important as the kind of fossils. Um, if you're in a place where you can find a lot, a lot of fossils, it might be somewhere like a cave where animals fell in there and died and their bones were left there. Um, or in Los Angeles, there's a place called the La Brea Tar Pits where a lot of animals fell into the tar a long time ago and then they were turned into fossils um and hmm where could you find a lot of fossils sometimes in places where a river deposits so if you picture a river going curving around like this sometimes when the river flows around a bend a lot of the sand and rock gets deposited on the bank of the river there um, and so if there are animals that die nearby or in the river like frogs and fish um, you might get a lot of bones in an area like that, but uh, they would be all sort of jumbled up um, and not really like one skeleton laid out. Places where you find like a big skeleton laid out would be like ocean fossils, like a big whale that died in the ocean and floated to the bottom and was just laid out there and then um, covered in sediment over time, over millions of years. Um, the fossil that I'm working on now, this primate, is sort of laid out as a skeleton, but kind of jumbled up, like maybe its leg is up here by its arm, and maybe its shoulder is like over here, um, because it may have died 
on the ground and then was sort of messed up by the water flowing down from the mountain. Um, so it's hard, to, it's hard to say where the most fossils come from. It just depends on what kind of fossils you're looking for and how mixed up they are um, with each other. That's awesome, Carrie. I'm learning so much about fossils. I'm sure it <laughs> are too, Ms. Reitman's class. Thank you for that question. Um, uh -huh. I'm going to bring up Mrs. Sullivan, who is asking questions for her remote class tuning in. Hey, thank you. Yes, I've learned so much too. Um, one quick question, the tibia that you're uncovering right now, which animal did you say that was? And then a question from my class is, how long does it usually take to get the bone out? Does it depend on the size or the condition? Yes. Okay, so first of all, the animal that I'm working on is called Smilodectes. Um, it's a lemur-like primate that lived in North America. Mm, I'm just going to check on the number of millions, and I, I'm going to show you something else on my way back. But let's look. Okay, so here in Wyoming, they are 52 to 47 million years old. Some of them might be as old as 56 million years old. So that's the, the primate that we're looking at. Um, looks like this, but this one's a different guy called Natharctus, very similar to the one I'm working on. Um, and then the rodent jaw that I showed you guys was between 37 to 29 million years old. That's from Egypt. Um, so Smilodectes is the name. And just real quick, I'm gonna sit down by this poster. It says the first lemur, um, Natharctus, is that little guy that I just showed you out there. Very similar to the primate that I'm working on now. Um, and this is a scan. We can put fossil and big rock chunks in a CT scan machine, like you would go in at the doctor's office. Um, and we can see all of the bones as they're laid out in the rock. And so you can see how we have sort of a laid out skeleton, um, but it has been jumbled up quite a bit by the water and the, and the rock that was flowing off the mountain. So here, this is the skull. You can see the teeth right here. Um, and then we've got some shoulder bones up here, the scapulae. We've got an arm bone. We've got some ribs floating around in this area. There's a rib, there's a rib, um, some finger bones. There's some finger bones down here, some backbones, the vertebrae. There's more backbones, the vertebrae, the spinal column over here. We've got leg bones, we've got tail bones, and we've got more leg bones over here. So, oh, and this is an ankle bone. This is called an astragalus. Those are very fun. They tell you a lot of information about the animal. Um, and so in... Well, I, I'll answer the question about how long it takes me to prepare a fossil, but um, in talking about how we know what animal a fossil is from, um, there are a lot of people who study morphology, which means the shape of the bones and, and all of the characteristics that things like the skull and the teeth have, things like this ankle bone that tell you how the animal moved around. And so we can look at all these bones and say, hmm, I think this ankle bone looks like an animal that hops around in trees. Um, and we can compare it to skeletons that we have from animals today. So let's see, this is a skeleton of a lemur that lived today, recently. So this is not a fossil. Um, and we have his feet in here. Let's look. Hmm. So the little bones in here by the ankles. Mm -hmm. And here's the little hands. So we can look at the bones of animals that are alive today and see how similar or different they are um, from the fossils that we're finding. And then we can tell what it is. Um, and sometimes we can tell better than others. So for the level of detail that's in the fossil, um, we might be able to pinpoint what species it was, get really specific like that. Or if we don't know, uh, we, we just know generally the kinds of characteristics it had. Sometimes we just, it, we can put it in a genus or a family um, and not get so specific. But yeah, um, so that's about that. And then 
How long does it take me to get a fossil out of the rock? It does really depend on the size. This one, uh, I'll probably be able to get out by the end of the day. Um, it's pretty easy. But things like this skull that I had over here took me a very long time because of how complex it is. Um, and the jaw is still attached in there. Um, and then we've got its mandible too, the lower jaw. That took a while. Um, and there's lots of tiny little pieces that I'm still trying to figure out if they might go on somewhere like a puzzle. That is so awesome, Carrie. I had no idea that you could scan a fossil like that. Yes. And see all the bones in the rock. Um, we are going to check in with Mrs. Little's grade five, four, five class. They were very excited this morning. So I'm sure they are so excited to ask you a question. Yes. And this is another scan to let you see it. Hi. Hi. Hi um, I have a question. What do you do with the bones when you're done? Great question. Okay. So when the bones are done and they're all sturdy and they've been glued, um, like the ones over here, this one, we're going to call this one done for now because the bones are still, um, we call it in articulation. So they are where they're meant to be. Like some of the finger bones are still in the form of a hand. Um, and so we are going to scan this one again. And some paleontologists and researchers can look at the scan and the real fossil and make some measurements um, and, and look at the, the characters of the fossil. So that means like, on this finger bone, for example, like how long is the finger bone? How big is um, the part where the joint is in the finger? And like, can we figure out anything by looking at the shape of the fossils um, to let us know about how the animal may have moved or lived? Um, and you can do this um, too. We could scan the skull. We could understand the shape of the teeth and how complex the teeth are, and what does that tell us about how this, uh, what this animal ate? Like, did it eat fruit or leaves? Um, and so, yeah, there's lots that fossils can tell us once they are out of the rock. Um, and that's the important, the important reason that we need to get them out of the rock um, so we can see them and scan them and study them. Um, th something that's also very cool about skulls, not for primates, but for birds, if you scan the skull of a bird, the inside of the skull of a bird is the shape of its brain. So you can see the shape that a bird's brain may have been by the inside of its skull. So when we find fossils of dinosaurs that were related to birds, we can see how big their brain was um, and what, is, what does that tell us about how that bird lived? Lots of very cool stuff. That's awesome. We have one more class um, to check in with, the Fremont third grade class. So I'm going to add them into the stream with you, Carrie. Uh -huh. Hi. Wow. This seems like amazing uh, work. What a great profession that you're, are, that you're studying to go into. Fantastic. Uh -huh. I have a question from Ben. Let me unmute him. Um, I found a um, imprint fossil when I was at a beach. Huh. Nice. Do you know what, what, what did it look like? Like a bird foot? Was it a footprint? Um, it looked like a seashell. Oh, yes. Um, seashells are some of the most common fossils that we have um, because they're, they always fall to the bottom of the ocean. Um, not always, but a lot of times they do. So from... Uh, for certain periods of time, like way older than these primates, we have lots and lots of seashell type fossils um, that tell us about the environment at that time. And there are also paleontologists that study the different kinds of seashell fossils that we can find um, and how many species were they and in what specific kind of like water did they live and where. Um, and that helps us know a lot about how the continents were shifting millions of years ago um, based on what seashells we can find. That's awesome. I wish I would have found a fossil. I've yet to do that, but maybe <laughs> I'm going to be on the search now because I'm <laughs> excited about this talk. Uh -huh. um, unfortunately, we only have a few minutes left, so I'm going to hand it back to you to 
Um, so any last things, Carrie? And also, if you can let our students know, because we have lots more questions coming in than we can um, answer today, where they can uh, ask those questions and find more information about um, the fossils and the organization and, and what you do. Yeah, great. Um, so on that note, so I'm at the Duke Lemur Center in our division of fossil primates. Um, and so if you have a question, you can forward it to your teacher and then either through Joe or Jesse, um, you can talk to people at the Duke Lemur Center like me or um, Matt Bortz, who you may have seen on Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants before, or Megan McGrath. Yep, there we go. Um, that's the Lemur Center website. And we are working on our exhibit for the fossil part of the Lemur Center. And so we've been making a lot of materials, educational things and posters and ways to lay out our fossils so that once coronavirus is over, more people can see what we have here. Um, and we're trying to do more of an online um, accessibility too. We're gonna do uh, a new database where we can keep all of the information from all of our fossils and upload some of the scans that we've, that we've scanned. Um, so that'll be a cool way to learn more too once we get that going. Um, and then also I just wanna say, um, this is a very specific job that I'm very lucky to have. Um, and probably people wonder how you would ever become a fossil preparator. Um, and I just sort of followed what I was interested in. So when I, when I went to college, I did think fossils were pretty cool as, as most people do. Um, and for my work study job, which is where you can earn money by working in a research lab at a college, um, I volunteered while I was working, working in a paleontology lab. Um, and I just started training and practicing um, with my mentor, Bill Sanders, and learning all about how to take fossils out of the rock like this. And I just really liked it and I wanted to keep doing it. So the whole time I was at college, I was working um, it, when I wasn't studying, I was working on fossils. Um, and so after college, I was good at it. And I went to work at another university with fossils. Um, so I just kept practicing and I just kept doing what I like to do. So I didn't set out originally to become a fossil preparator, but I am very happy that I am one now. And we're happy that you're one now too, so that we could hear you talk about it today. Thank you so much, Carrie. That was so interesting to see your demo and hear about what you're doing. Um, I'm sure everybody learned a lot because I learned a lot. Um, thank you so, so much for taking the time to talk to us today. You're welcome. Thank you guys All for right, having thank me. Thank you. I'm gonna bring everyone in to be able to. Say bye. 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 Bye